Tonight, Catwoman nearly gets some innocent civilians caught up in a firefight. The birds of prey nearly set fire to the Amazon rainforest, and Captain Adam goes back in time to give a little boy cancer. These are your heroes. All that and more this week on the Not So New 52. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 42 of the Not-So-New 52. I am your host, and hey, if you're anything like me demographically, you're probably on Reddit. I swear, that's not an insult for the most part, but if you are on Reddit, you've probably asked, boy, I sure do wish I had a place that I could post all of my favorite Mild Fuzz Network comments and entertainment such things, including my favorite show, The Not-So-New 52. Well, boy, do I have the place for you, introducing the official Mild Fuzz subreddit, r slash Mild Fuzz. We got real creative with the naming there. Uh, go on in and join. All the videos from across all of our networks are being posted on there, and you can come in and just share your thoughts on any given episode. Give us upvotes. Don't give us downvotes. Don't hurt my feelings. Pretty much any of that stuff's allowed. Um, I am a moderator, so I will ban you if you hurt my feelings. Try me. <laughs> All right. Anyway, that's it for the advertisement. Uh, I do hope to see you there. But for now, let's talk about comics. This week from DC Comics on June 20th, 2012, we only had 12 comics. That is a record low for quite a few months now. Uh, they were the number 10 issues of... Batwoman, Birds of Prey, Catwoman, Nightwing, Red Hood and the Outlaws, Supergirl, Green Lantern Corps, Captain Adam, DC Universe Presents, Wonder Woman, Blue Beetle, and Legion of Superheroes. Not really a star-studded week. No real standout titles there. Wonder Woman, maybe. I enjoy Blue Beetle, but it's kind of a B-tier week. But speaking of B-tier, let's talk about the Bat Family and their five comics that overwhelm the entirety of the week. So may as well just jump right into it. I'm not going to try to think of a better segue than that. Batwoman starts now. Batwoman number 10, written by J.H. Williams III and W. Hayden Blackman, art by Trevor McCarthy. Last issue we left off with... It's still doing the branching story thing, but the final thing we left off on was Batwoman being kissed by soon big shock there and then this issue picks up immediately afterwards where she immediately separates and is just like dude what are you doing and she's like i just i i craved you batwoman but then she immediately gets up and goes over to falchion who is like significantly dying at this point and she plunges his or plunges a sword into his chest to which batwoman does not respond positively to uh, cut over to Maggie's story. There is another girl who's been killed. And basically they think it's, again, La Llorona. And Maggie's met up with by Jim Gordon. And Jim's basically, it seems like we're in the middle of a conversation here. But Maggie's just like, look, I know that everyone's calling on me to, like, resign or at least leave the case. But I'm close here, Jim. And I just need you to trust me, okay? And Jim's like, just please get this done and she's like we'll do totally so she walks away and she goes up to the top of the hill and she makes a call and someone else answers to whoever she's reaching but then she finally gets through to someone she says uh hi pixie uh, i just need to hear your voice sweetheart so whoever this may be then we cut over to jacob kane still in the hospital with bet and he's just basically talking to her and recounting a story of how they, he always tried to like, you know, he was trying to protect his uh, daughters throughout the life. And at one point their family cat got sick. And so he took it outside and put it down he, with his 44 and he tried to keep the daughter shielded from it, but both his daughter ended up seeing it. And Beth ended up crying and crying and crying. Whereas Kate was just, she just grabbed a shovel and helped out. So he sees a lot of himself in Kate and how much he, you know, is there and is defensive. But then he realizes as he's talking that 
He thinks that despite the fact he wasn't anything like Beth, he might have loved her more than Kate, and that seems to be a really hard thing for him to come to grips with. Then we cut to Chase's story. He's down in she the whole group uh, on their way to attack uh, Falchion is down in the sewers, and they meet up with Killer Croc, who basically just straight up, like, they had the drop on him, and they're like, all right, give up Killer Croc, and we promise we'll go easy on him. He's like, LOL, right? And he points up to right above him in these sewer lines, and there's just all these bombs there. And he's there, it just goes off and just destroys everything around. Uh, Killer Croc obviously gets away, but then we see that Chase is uh, going up to one of her fellow agents named McDonough, who is he's not going to make it. He's not okay. And she's just there giving him some comfort. Um, as Batwoman and Soon come up and say, like, hey, we're close. Do you want to come with you? Like, we need to go do this now. And Chase is just like, no, I got, I got this to do. You guys go handle this and I'll be here. So he, he just, she just comforts the dying agent. Then we cut to Kate's story. I think at the exact same time as, no, sorry. It's about seven hours after, um, her father's story. And we see her as Batwoman just outside the hospital room, just seeing Bet and her father resting by her bedside. And then she goes off to do more superhero things. Then we get Morrow's story. And this is Morrow's story has always been the stuff that is showing how the monsters are made. And we finally see, okay, how did Killer Croc turn from kind of humanoid crocodile-looking guy to super beast crocodile? And we see that she has some thing where she's going to bring out like there was the ancient egyptian god that had like a crocodile head and there were other dragon beliefs in china or whatever blah 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 she just throws out a bunch of mythological mumbo jumbo gets wayland to drink some potion that she says is the blood of virgins and then he becomes this super huge crocodile who's here to feed on a couple of sacrifices that they've laid out so yeah there's that anyway back to the main framing story um that woman grabs the sword out of falchion and tell Soon off, like, no, we're not going to kill him. Stop with the murdering stuff. And Soon's like, no, the only thing that's going to end this is if he dies by his own sword. And he's like, no, we're going to do this the right way. And she's like, fine, whatever. So then she reveals, all right, he's out at least, so I can take my rightful place as the head of Medusa. And Batwoman is, of course, taken off guard. Like, what? You're actually evil? Like, we know she was. And then we see her shapeshift, and she stops being soon and turns into Maro, the one we've been following, the one that makes all the monsters. Turns out that soon may have just been a disguise this whole time. But anyway, Maro's just like, hi, I'm Maro. Please kneel before me. And that's where we leave off. It's it's pretty simple overall in terms of the story. I Honestly... I don't feel like everybody... There's nothing that really gets forwarded this issue save for the framing device. Like, we get a little bit of character development with uh, Jacob's story, which, to be fair, it's always been. We are, like... W did we really need to know how Killer Croc became that? Maybe the Maggie story is going to be a thing, but besides that, it's genuinely a pretty light issue overall. There's not a lot going on here. So, it's not bad. The art, I would say, is pretty good throughout. I do like the... Um, the panel where soon just it's very graphic there are like four eyes and a bunch of just revealed tendons and muscles i very much like the art there and just throughout it's also very good obviously the layouts are fantastic as they have been so yeah no it's fine it's just doesn't feel like plot wise it's really doing anything and as i've said for like the past three issues i'm really tired of the multiple plot lines all at once because I feel like nothing's getting forwarded in any of them. Like, yes, we do have the occasional little, oh, here's something we're doing, but just tell me linearly. I, I'm, I'm telling you that if I were to take these pages, once this arc is done and put them in, like, proper chronological order, this story would make just as much sense. If, no, it would make far more sense even. So, yeah, no, it's it's okay. It's fine. I'm giving it a... I'm giving it a 6.5, and that extra 0.5 is just for the art. Writing-wise, I still think it's around a 6, and I'm just really tired of this framing device because reading week to week, it doesn't work. Reading in trade, it might work a bit better, but 
I don't think it does. I think that it genuinely still stays confusing that you are having these massive back and forth time jumps. So 6.5 and we'll get done probably next week. I don't know. Birds of Prey, number 10, written by Dwayne Sprzynski, art by Travel Foreman. Last issue we left off with a Night of the Owls tie-in, but the big reveal at the end was that Poison Ivy was put on ice, and Starling said that she had to deal with Poison Ivy, where she has to take her to go do something. And this is the issue where they go do something. So we open up with a chopper being piloted by a guy named Layden, who I guess is kind of friends with Starling. And they're over top of the Amazon Basin in Colombia, along with a essentially a casket that has poison ivy in it. So there's that. So anyway, it's Batgirl, Katana, and Black Canary, along with Starling and Poison Ivy. And they're all in this chopper just saying, like, all right, well, apparently the deal that was made was that we have to get Poison Ivy to this area because it is a, quote, pulsating core of the green. And then a heat-seeking missile hits the helicopter. And everything happens so fast, but they fall out of the sky. But everyone's all right. And the issue now is how do we deal with all the stuff that just happened? So uh, Starling looks around trying to figure out what in the hell happened to um, Layden. Meanwhile, the other ones are trying to break open. Sorry, Starling and Katana. Meanwhile, Black Canary and Batgirl are trying to pry open the casket that has poison ivy in it because she's supposed to be their guide. And they were supposed to have like a day or two to thaw her out. But... Oops. So then we go to Gotham City during the Night of the Owls and we see the Birds of Prey meeting up with Batman to deliver the Talon that they captured along with getting Poison Ivy out of their cryogenic thing. And Batman's pretty much like, you guys all suck and you're trusting Poison Ivy and she can't be trusted and Black Canary, you suck the most out of everyone. And <laughs> Black Canary's like, dude... What is wrong with you? I I swear to God, I will canary cry your face off. And Batgirl's like, hey, just don't make it a thing. Just just give him, he, he's had a rough couple days. Just just chill. So then we go see uh, Starling and Katana, who are prying laden out of the chopper. He's also fine. But then they notice a giant tear in the hull of the chopper. And it turns out that this wasn't just a trip for the sake of bringing them down to Columbia. Layden brought along quote, 100 gallons of pure liquid cocaine. And I was thinking maybe this was a euphemism for some other, like, super drug. But no, it is actually liquid cocaine. And apparently, according to Starling, as we'll see later, is highly flammable and explosive. So as she's looking over this stuff, uh, someone, some green hand reaches out and touches her on the shoulder. Go back to Black Canary and Batgirl, who've managed to open up the casket with Poison Ivy inside. And they get talking about, like, redemption and whether or not people can change. Blah, blah. Who cares? Until, finally, they're attacked by some giant vine-looking creature that does have, like, a human face and eyes on it. So, plenty of issues there. Meanwhile, over at Katana and Starling, they're also being attacked by a whole bunch of vine creatures, significantly smaller ones, though, but still humanoid in nature. Katana sets off the liquid cocaine, because of course, which also adds the benefit of them having the heat-seeking missiles going towards them, because they expect there to be more heat-seeking missiles for some reason. So they make their way through the green men. Katana's chopping through them, realizes they don't have any souls. Another missile does show up, because why not? And they realize, oh, we're not far enough away from the fire yet. Everyone hold on to something, and it explodes. Back over with Black Canary and uh, Batgirl dragging Poison Ivy's body through the jungle. They're just trying to, like, stay ahead of this giant monster. They're not even trying to beat it. Starling and Katana finally catch up, and they all run their way to the edge of a cliffside. There is a downed bridge, like Indiana Jones-style bridge, where it's just this rope thing, and... Batgirl's like, it's, we can make it over the bridge, and just over there is a safe house, but my zip line has snapped. How can we ever make it over? And Black Canary has a very brief flashback to her husband saying, don't be afraid of your powers. Embrace them. You can control it. To which she grabs the rope bridge that has snapped. She jumps over the edge of the cliff, 
screaming down to the ground, and that allows her to fly. Because she's screaming with such force, she can fly across the gap. And she lands on the other side. She ties up the rope bridge. Everyone makes it across. Starling sets off some C4 on the other side so that the green things can't follow. And then as they get over to the other side, Poison Ivy wakes up. And she's like, oh, hey, you guys did what I asked you to do. That's cool. Now let me explain what's going on in the next issue. <sighs> okay, so clearly, talking about the green, if you've been keeping up with Swamp Thing, there's obviously ties in with that. These are all very Swamp Thing-esque looking monsters. So I feel like I get that much already. If that's going to be the whole explanation, then whatever. Um, canary Flying. It sounds cool. Like, when I say it, it sounds either stupid or cool. But, like, I feel like it sounds cool in concept. The issue being is that they didn't really make it this triumphant moment. Like, her jumping off the cliff is in the bottom of one page. And then you only get, like, two panels at the top of the next one for people to be like, Oh, hey, she's flying. That's cool. And it's just, I don't know, it didn't feel as, Wow, look at that cool use of her powers it just felt more like a yeah okay this this thing happened moving on also we saw that she used her powers to stop the missile like from actually exploding on them like she exploded it a little bit first but like yeah i because they showed that like that it, they made it as if it was a reveal but it wasn't i don't know i'm just i'm very soured on this book and i know that's probably making me judge these things a little bit harsher than i would be otherwise but I don't know. It's just not it's just not hitting me the same way that like some of those earlier issues was. Travel Foreman, however, um, on art. Line work, fine. Coloring, I was so used to his work on Animal Man where I thought he was fantastic and really suit the mood. He doesn't quite suit the mood here. Uh, it is not, it, like, he has a more sort of grotesque style and he was able to make that happen with the giant green monster thing. But with just regular people's faces, it doesn't work as well. And the coloring, also, not what I'm used to with his line work, but it's not bad. It's definitely fine in general. So overall, I'm going to have to give this one a... I'm going to have to give it a 5.5, and I'm only going that much because I do like the idea that we're setting up something where it's not just like some weird mind games like it just seems like okay here's they're lost in the jungle we can't possibly have a thing where who's going to double cross who and who's going to betray who else it's just no we're just trying to get poison ivy back to health that's it and i'm good with that i'm fine with that but i still feel like they're gonna mess it up somehow Catwoman number 10, written by Judd Winnick, art by Gillam March. Last issue was a Night of the Owls tie-in, but the primary plot that we're picking up here is that somebody is picking up prostitutes and children off of the streets and taking them somewhere, to which Catwoman is very concerned about at least the prostitute side of things. So we pick up this issue with Detective Alvarez is being told by some new character named Yolanda that I have never seen before. Basically, she saw some evidence of a couple of detectives taking Catwoman's files out of the system and making it like she was never even there. And they're not doing it for any good reasons, clearly. So she thought she'd inform Alvarez that these particular police officers and detectives and whatever, they are bad cops. We already knew that because of prior issues, but now he knows as well. So... Then we cut down to a street where, as we've seen in previous issues, a dude in a van is trying to coax a sex worker into the van. And the dude's like, hey, hop on in. And the sex worker's like, I don't think so. That's a bad idea. To which the man in the van says, tough. And he shoots him with a tranquilizer dart, knocks him out, and puts him in the van anyway. At this point, Catwoman jumps in, kicks out the window, and a fight scene kicks out. And I say fight scene in so much as... The dude in the van pulls a assault rifle and starts shooting at Catwoman. To which Catwoman then leaps behind another car, gets her hands on a pistol of her own, and starts firing back. So 
It's just a shootout in the middle of this street to which Catwoman is like, man, I kind of suck at doing the hero thing because the people I'm trying to protect, a.k.a. the sex workers, are currently fleeing from the firefight that I'm causing. But as soon as she gets in the fight, is as soon as it ends, is Spark shows up in a stolen car, opens up the door and says, like, come with me if you want to live, and then just drives away. And Catwoman, she gets in the car of her own volition, but then immediately, as soon as they get out of, like, the street and turn off onto an alley she immediately jumps out like we have to go back we have to save them and spark is like what is your problem man like the, the cops are going to show up there you're a wanted criminal and he's like i don't care we have to help them no one else will and spark rightly asks the question of like why do you care like, what is this to you? Why do you have to be the one to save them? To which Catwoman gets all emotional and says, like, because I was taken, much like they were, and no one was there to save me. To which Spark thinks that this is the appropriate moment to go in for that big kiss that has been teased. So, you do you, buddy. We cut back to the guy who was taken in the van, and he's woken up in this very sterile-looking room, it does still have amenities to it, though. It's not, like, just a completely empty room. And a voice over the intercom is basically saying, all right, here's the deal. You have lived a life of, like, poverty and dirtiness, and, you know, you weren't good. You didn't have a good life. So what I'm doing is I am keeping you here, yes, against your will, to basically detox, and we're going to get you through all your drug habits, and we're also going to get you on medications for any diseases you may have, and... When you're out of here, you'll be able to start a new life, one that is totally free of all that stuff you had before. And the guy is, you know, hearing it, but he doesn't seem exactly too excited about all this happening to him against his will. And, but we are seeing snapshots of other people in this place that seemingly are going through the things that he's describing. So maybe he's on the up and up. I say that knowing that the next page reveals him walking next to a hospital gurney where... One of the girls that he was showing having been a success is actually dead and how they are going to harvest her body parts to be sold on the black market. And any of her organs that aren't taken, they're just going to sew her back up and going to turn her into a human doll to live in this guy's dollhouse where he has at least like eight other people here all completely just posed like action figures in this dollhouse. So that's, that's what we're doing this arc. A human trafficker who makes dolls. So, and we get to Catwoman who is training. She's doing some, you know, aerobics or whatever. And Gwen is talking to her, trying to get her to take on some tiny little petty crimes, to which Catwoman is just not interested. And she says, because of the penguin thing that we did last issue, I've got a ton of money. I can afford to be choosy with my jobs. But then Gwen reminds her how... It's not about her having jobs. It's about her not having the free time to go out and do stupid shit as Catwoman. To which Catwoman's like, hey, hey, I totally got this. It's totally good. And don't worry, I won't be on my own for very long, wink. And I say wink because the next page is Detective Alvarez coming into his apartment, still on the phone with Yolanda, and just saying like, oh, well, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to take care of this on my own, Yolanda. Don't get involved. You are a one pot, one page character and I'm not letting you get back in again and he takes off his badge and his gun hangs up on Yolanda to which he finds Catwoman in his kitchen essentially saying like hey I'm here let's talk and finally we get the last page reveal of all the dirty cops meeting up in some random dirty building and just saying like why is what did Catwoman do with our money did she ditch it is it in the hands of Batman is Batman on our case now I hope Batman's not on our case now to which a mysterious figure is saying like, hey, don't worry about it. It's just Catwoman. She's, she's just a thief. She's nothing more than that. And I'll tell you where you can find her because I am. And you turn the page and it's Spark. Wow. Curse your sudden but inevitable betrayal. Yeah, no, it, that's all it is. It's, just, it's Spark. Like from page one, you knew that he was going to be double crossing her at some point. And I will give them credit. They delayed it a bit longer than I thought they would. But I feel like that's also because we had a tie in issue to an event in the middle there where they really couldn't do that. They couldn't do the reveal there. So half points at the minimum. It's fine. Art is the same. It has been. I think I'm actually less OK with the Gillum March on this. I can't really point to what it is specifically. It's just 
I don't know. There's just something to it. It's the doll stuff all looks great. It's because it's got this weird sort of. You know what it is? It's because it's not. It's humans, but there's something off about them. That's what makes it work. Is because that is exactly how it feels. So yeah, no, it's fine. It's it's an okay part of the story. I think that making that final page reveal is like, yeah, we get it. He's double. Of course he is. Why wouldn't he be? Catwoman's always getting double cross. Shut up. So no, overall, I'm going to give this one a... I give it a six. It's okay. It's not great. It's just there. It's got its issues, but it's it's not doing anything offensively wrong. So, whatever. Nightwing number 10, written by Kyle Higgins, art by Eddie Barrows and Geraldo Borges. Last issue was a tie-in to Night of the Owls, but the general overarching plot was that somebody found a murder scene that had Nightwing's Eskrima sticks used as the murder weapon. So he's out to clear his name. So this issue picks up with Nightwing talking about the historic district of Gotham and how in all the other cities, the historic district is this nice place. It's a great place to go. It's got nightlife and whatnot. Meanwhile, Gotham's historic district is kind of the worst, much like the rest of the city. But hey, that's why he's here. So then he gets into the apartment where these men were found. And the coroner apparently noted that Yes, they were beaten up by the Eskimistics, but they also seemed to have some burning on their arms, and they were, couldn't figure out why that happened. But then he sees there's this big painting on the wall of an alpha symbol and an omega symbol, like, merged together. Think, like, the anarchy symbol, but instead of a circle, it's the omega symbol. And he's like, huh, what if that burning was them trying to burn off tattoos? That could be something. But before he's even able to, like, do anything about it, police kick in the door, throw in some flashbangs, some smoke bombs, and unleash fire on Nightwing. He, of course, dodges around, does some acrobatic, acrobatics, kicks their faces in, and as he's doing so, he gets a call from Lucius Fox at uh, basically Wayne Enterprises, and he's like, hey, Dick, do you have a minute to talk? And Nightwing in the middle of a fight's like, uh, give me a minute, and he busts out through a window to get away from the fight, to which he then... They have a talk about Nightwing wants has some plan in mind, something that he wants to do, but he needs a lot of funding for it. He doesn't want to go to Bruce for it, and Lucius is like, well, it's a big stretch, this thing you want to do, which we'll get to later, but I do have someone who might be interested if you want to go for it. And it's like, all right, well, what's the big deal? Why not just hook me up? And it's like, well, the person that I think would have an interest is uh, Tony Zuko's daughter, Sonia Zuko. And Tony Zuko, for those who don't know, is the person who killed Dick Grayson's parents. So there's that. Anyway, cut to the apartment building where Nightwing was just at sometime later. And there's a detective there who's taking the lead on the case called Detective Nye. And Gordon's come up and is like, Detective Nye, what in the hell are you doing? You just unleashed fire in a like residential building. And Nye's like, yeah, we heard Nightwing was in there. He just killed people. He's a threat. And Gordon's like, dude... Don't push me on this, I swear to God. And Nye's like, oh yeah, take me off the case. I dare you. I will sue this place. And you specifically, Gordon. To which we cut to City Hall a little while later. And Gordon's talking to the deputy mayor about Nye. And apparently Nye was brought brought forward on suspicions of taking evidence of like a batarang and using it on a corpse. And, like someone who was already committed, like who had already been killed, and then using that to frame a case against Batman, which is why he had a whole bunch of the police after him through a whole bunch of different stories. So at that point, Gordon's like, yeah, we couldn't quite tie it to him, and he threatened to sue if we ever did fire him without super proof that he did it. So, yeah. And so the deputy mayor, because of the events of last issue where he was saved by Nightwing, he was like, all right, cool. What can I do to help? And Gordon's like, are you, are you, you want to, City Hall wants to actually be on my side for once? And they're like, heck yeah, let's do it. Also, don't worry about what Mayor Haiti thinks. He's kind of a dick. So then we go to Dick and Sonia, who are just walking down the street talking. And Sonia's like, this is weird, isn't it? And he's like, yeah, kind of. But you know what? 
I, I have to believe that you want to change for the better, much like I want to change this city for the better. And she's like, all right, stop the pitch. What do you, what do you want to do? And they've ended up at Amusement Mile, which is basically a theme park inside of Gotham. And it's all run down, and, you know, the Joker's been there for a while, uh, sporadically before this. And Dick Grayson's like, I want to bring it back. I want to, this used to be what made Gotham fun. This was a place that people could just forget their troubles for a while. Gotham kind of sucks. Let's bring this back. And Sonya's like, okay, kind of interested. You're going to need a centerpiece, right? And she's like, yeah, I got something in mind. Cut back over to the circus where he's talking to the, the one clown, Jimmy. And he's like, you guys maybe want to just be a permanent act at the amusement mile rather than being on the road all the time in Haley Circus? And Jimmy's like, I don't know if they're going to be for that, but I'll talk to him. And he's like, thanks, buddy. You're the best. So let me cut to Zeke's tattoo parlor where there are four guys in there and they're all getting tatted up and Nightwing stops in, talks to one of them and be like, hey, heard you were real close to these specific guys who were killed recently and I I know they had tattoos. What do you know? And they were like, I don't know nothing about nothing. Same as I told that detective guy. I was like, what detective guy? Detective Nye. Oh, crap. Detective Nye's on my case. To which... Fire is then unleashed upon the whole tattoo parlor, but this time it isn't the cops. It's a bunch of people wearing those Alpha and Omega symbols as before. So Nightwing kicks out the lights and then starts kicking all their butts, to which he finally gets them all strung up, and he just starts interrogating them. He's like, all right, who's going to tell me what happened? To which the leader seemingly is like, I ain't telling you nothing. But then he turns over to a dude who like is very visibly shaken, and he's like, what do you know, Robbie? And Robbie's like, uh, I don't remember. And then it cuts to Nightwing swinging through the city, just dangling Robbie by a wire. And he's like, uh, we're called the Republic of Tomorrow, and we meet at the clock tower. Please put me down. So then Nightwing sets him back down, goes to the clock tower, and he's like, well, you know, I can deal with a group of a couple of teenagers that think they got some anarchist group going on here. But when he goes in, he sees, like, a full military training ground with all of these dudes dressed in the same gear, an entire arsenal at their disposal. And there's this guy walking out basically saying, like, we will be the the good of tomorrow and we will pave the way for the god of tomorrow because that is our calling. And then he unleashes, like, an electronic whip thing that knocks Nightwing out of the rafters, causes to crash into the ground, and he introduces himself as Paragon, Gotham's true son. And the future of this city hinges on Nightwing's death. Sure, whatever. So, lame villain notwithstanding, because, like, yeah, no, he's doing it for the good of the city, because this is totally everything's about that. So, besides that part, I like the other plot going on. I like the plot of Detective Nye framing Nightwing, and I like the plot of him trying to basically get the amusement park up and running. That being said, I do hope that they're able to give a better send-off to Haley Circus than just, no, we don't want to really do that, bye. Like, give them something. Give them, because they set that entire first arc up, and we have Dick in charge of an entire circus. Yes, it did try to kill a bunch of people at the last showing. However, I don't think that can't be overcome with some good publicity. So... It's good. It's a solid issue. I think that these particular villains that feel like they're just for this arc are pretty lame. And especially because, like, I have no idea what they're going for. I'm sure we'll get to it, but, like, this is an entire semi-military occupation here. And I don't even know what they want. They're just talking about the good of tomorrow, which, great. Good for you. So, overall, I give this one a... I give it a 7. Because honestly, that it's such a small little thing that the villains are lame. Because maybe they'll get fleshed out better. It's not, it's not a huge impact on this issue. So, 7-4 right now, and we'll see how it goes from there. Red Hood and the Outlaws, number 10, written by Scott Labdell, art by Kenneth Rockefort. This is essentially a new arc. You don't really need to know much else going into it beforehand. But uh, we got an opening page, literally no dialogue, just an opening page of Arsenal and Starfire sleeping together in bed. Arsenal's the little spoon and a dude with an axe standing in, over top of their bed. We'll get back to that. So then we go to 
down at the basement of or down at the base of their building. Uh, we are in Miami, where Jason is on a date with that airline stewardess that he met like in issue three or whatever. And her name is Isabel, and they're just they've been talking for like and the entire night just getting to know each other. Of course, Jason has been lying about everything. And he's like, oh, all right, well, it's, we're already at morning now, so can I call you a cab? And she's like, no. He's like, well, I got to go to bed. And he's like, I can join you. And he's like, no, nah, I'm really not. And then she smooches him. And as they're going for the kiss, and he is completely disengaged with all that, he looks up and sees a giant alien beast, like, hurtling down towards them. Uh, Jason dives them both out of the way. Red, he gets his red hood mask on, pulls out his gun, is just like, stay here, I'll be back. So he unloads some shots on this alien beast, and he's like, dude, what was that supposed to be for? Was that supposed to hurt? And Red Hood's like, hopefully. To which Isabel finally gets up, and is just like, you don't really own a dry cleaning business, do you? And Jason's like, no, I'm sorry. And she's like, whatever, guys lie. So then Starfire comes down, and she's like, how dare you lay hands on me? Who, do you know who I am? And he's like, yes, of course, Your Majesty. It, I apologize. It is, it is I. I should have, I should have knocked. I, I really shouldn't have been standing over the bed. I should have knocked. To which Starfire's like, oh, Orn, Orn, my old friend. Come here. Let me give you a hug. Arsenal finally joins in. They're like, I'm sorry, you guys know each other? And basically Starfire asks, what's going on? And Orn says, there's some big bad stuff going on, and only you can fix it. To which Red Hood and Starfire, or Red Hood and Arsenal, are just going back and forth like, Psh, she doesn't want to go with you. She's happy here with us. Piss off, alien guy. And Isabel's in the bathroom background just being like, this is the worst date I've ever been on. So Starfire surprises everyone by saying, no, it is my duty. I must go to my people. Let's go. And Orin just teleports, is planning on teleporting Starfire and uh, himself out. But then Red Hood and Arsenal are like, well, if you're going to go, we're going to go with. And so they tell Orin to teleport everybody up. So everyone's now on this ship. And apparently it was super dangerous that they get teleported in whatever specific way they did. Uh, but Orin brings her inside and just gives her the rundown of like, uh, we're, we're in Tamaran's orbit. There's a whole bunch of bad guys around and we need you to do your thing. So she goes inside. Meanwhile, Arsenal and Red Hood are standing outside like, huh, okay, well, guess we should try to figure out what's going on. And Red Hood looks behind and realizes, oh, wait, Isabel was teleported up here with us. Great. So Isabel immediately is just like, you know, you could have just told me the truth. And, like, I could have decided for myself whether or not I wanted to do that. Like, what? How, how shallow do you think I am? And he's like, okay, fair enough. So we see the bridge of this ship. Uh, there's a Dominator who is currently acting as captain, but once Corey shows up, he's like, oh, no, this is your ship. I was just keeping your seat warm. And we get the explanation here that if I can, if I, well, okay, before any of that, Red Hood storms in, says we need to send Isabel home. She says, sorry, can't do that. And then we just deal. So anyway, we get the lay down of the attack, and it's some giant group of starships called the Blight who came in and they've been like laying waste to all the planets in their way and they've come in to Tamran's orbit they've disabled the planet's defense shields but they haven't actually done anything yet and they think it's because they're waiting for Starfire so Starfire pulls up the comms and just makes a direct contact to him and says like hey this is Starfire or Princess Coriander Go ahead and give up now, and I promise you that you will, like, you might live. Otherwise, you will die. And Red Hood and Arsenal are like, she's so badass. And that's where we leave off. There is a backup, which I'm not going to cover in this. I'll cover it at a different point. But, okay. Like, I, it's it's such a left turn. It's such a thing of, like, all right, we were doing this thing. We were talking about, like, you know, the all cast and, like, how we, we had all these unknown things. And then it's just, like, mm, space. Now we're just doing space now. We're doing this whole story. And I don't hate it inherently. I think it's fine. I think bringing Isabel in is just like to give Red Hood and Arsenal something to do. Because Starfire really feels in her element here. Like this is the stuff she was raised for. Instead of all the fish out of water stuff down on Earth. Now we flipped it. And I'm okay with that. My only issue is, is that if we want a fish out of water story. You could just keep it at Red Hood and Arsenal. You didn't need a fish out of water to accompany the two other fishes out of water. 
if that makes any sense. Isabel just feels superfluous right now. If she does something great, cool, I'll take it. But right now she just feels like, oh, we need some regular person to show how crazy all this space stuff is. And I'm like, no, that's what Arsenal and Red Hood are. They're just guys good with bows and guns. So it's okay. It's perfectly fine. Very short because of the backup, but it's fine. So I'll go ahead and give it a... I'll give it a 6.5. It's... Art-wise, it's good. Like, I do like the art throughout. It does a great job. Uh, we're introduced to this one character named... I mean, everyone here has names. Uh, the guy on the captain's chair named DiPaolo. There's another... Uh, Tamaranian named Kitten, which I think is just supposed to be announced Kitten, but regardless, they, she's got this cool haircut going on. Everyone's got names. Kenneth Rockford does a great job drawing them. I'm just, it's one of those things where it still feels like we're supposed to be dropped in the middle of this and not know what's going on and we'll be explained it later. I'm hoping that's the case because if we're never actually explained it later and this was supposed to be the explanation, I'm going to be very upset because there's not really much of an explanation in here. Yes, we do get a brief little summary of what's happening, but, like, you need to pace it a bit slower, bud. But for this particular issue, not worrying about the future, 6.5. Supergirl number 10, written by Michael Green and Mike Johnson, art by Mahmoud Asrar, last issue. We left off with Supergirl charging into Black Banshee to try to overload his absorption of energy. But all she did was just make him stronger, and it seems like he now has the upper hand. This issue is basically just... How do we deal with that situation? And we see it all from Supergirl's perspective of right now she's waking up. She's on top of a table and it's apparently she's getting Jenna scanned or gene scanned in order to be gene matched with somebody. It's just a matchmaking service on Krypton and she doesn't want to do it. But her mom is there and her mom is like, well, these these, these are our customs. You must do it. If, how else will I find someone for such a rambunctious young daughter of mine and supergirl's narration realizes wait a minute no 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 this is a memory like uh, i'm this definitely happened like i remember this and we walked out of the room and then we went somewhere else but then we see that she's in a different memory where they went to some firefalls uh just a bunch of lava on krypton and she's still there with her mother she's like okay well we're not supposed to be here but regardless mom i don't want to do the matchmaking thing and she's like well you have to my daughter how else are you supposed to find a match and she's like you and dad did and she's like shut up fine you want your own destiny have your own destiny and then we see her eyes get blacked out saying like i'm leaving you all alone now and she walks off into one of the firefalls to which supergirl's like wait a minute that's not what happened this is what happened this is all like some messed up nightmare memory this is this is stupid to which then Black Banshee shows up in the form of a giant fire dragon out of the flames. And he's like, hey, yeah, uh, I absorbed you. Uh, you didn't immediately get dissolved into me. So I'm just here picking away at your last little essences of consciousness, which I am fully privy to hear all of your thoughts and see all of these nightmares. Also, I'm a dragon. So he goes and attacks Supergirl. But then she... As she thinks about how her father used to tell her stories of fire dragons and people on Krypton fighting against them, she is then dressed in the armor of the people who used to fight against them. So she does have some control over her own dreams. Um, but the fire dragon unleashes a big blast or whatever. And as it knocks her off her little platform that was protecting her, she ends up down inside some water. And when she comes up, she's in another memory of a crystalline forest where her dad used to take her just to get away from the city every once in a while and as she reaches the shore she's met by tom Smythe, aka the son who sacrificed himself to stop black banshee's curse like last issue the issue before somewhere in there um and she recognizes the name is like wait a minute you're shaban's brother and he's like whoa you know shaban she survived that's great that's fantastic however you seem a bit old how long have I been in here for? Because it does—it seems like it was only yesterday, or maybe a thousand years, somewhere in there. So he explains, you know, I did this, I was fighting my father, but oopsie, didn't work out the way it was supposed to, so I've just been running around in dreams of other people that he's absorbed in here. 
So, yeah. And she's like, well, now, hold on. I think I might know a way out of here so that we can go and help Shaban. And he's like, all right, what do you got? And he's like, well, I get my power because of my yellow sun energy. He absorbed me and my energy. Therefore, the yellow sun energy is still inside of him. If I can just pull on that, maybe I can do things. Because, by the way, she also doesn't have her powers while she's in the dreamscape. So she imagines it and she constructs a sword out of nothing that she's able to use. And as she does so and as she's starting to explain all this and her plan to Tom, Black Banshee comes back and attacks, still is a dragon, and he's like, hey, you found my son. I've been feeling him itching around in my brain for a while. Now I get to kill you both. What a great day this is. So, and by the way, all this is an Irish accent. I'm not even going to bother with that, but, like, there's a lot of lasses and lads and whatnot. So, uh, Supergirl's ready to fight against Black Banshee, and she realizes, like, maybe I still have the, I don't have the energy to fly, but maybe I can still jump real good. So she jumps up on top of Black Banshee and is start riding on his back, and she, she is just like, wow, you know, this dreamscape seems really real. I, I wonder how much of this is actually, like, fatal. But uh, as she's... Doing so, she almost falls off a of Black Banshee. She manages to get her grip back on. She constructs yet another sword in order to fight him and then just does the cross-cut off with your head sort of routine to which he explodes with energy and we go back out into the real world and see that Supergirl and Tom have both been ejected from Black Banshee and he's just coughing on the ground. He's like, what was that? What did you do to me? To which Shaban steps up and is just like, oh, hey, you're weak now? That's cool. I'm going to absorb you. And she does her banshee cry and absorbs her father and then starts laughing maniacally, saying, like, I've done it. I can't even feel him inside of me. I've won. I've won. To which Tom steps up and is like, hey, Shaban. Shaban freaks out for a second before realizing, ah, brother, you're alive. Oh, great job. This is Supergirl, you saved my brother. I'm so proud of you. And then immediately they're met up by the American military, who, if you remember, was like just down the street for a while there. And while they were in the dreamscape, Tom was able to understand Kryptonian. Now they're out in the real world. He doesn't, but of course Shaban still does. So Supergirl tells Shaban to tell Tom, like, hold on tight. I'm going to fly us out of here faster than they can track us down. So here we go. And she flies away real quick. So then we get an elsewhere to a dude in a suit I don't know if I'm supposed to recognize the dude, but he has some sort of like camouflaging tech on him and he turns into like this machine looking thing and he turns into a soldier and then some blonde woman and then a cop. And then in the end, he turns into like this Ultron looking robot with like eight eyes and he's like, yes, now the mission can commence. Commence mission Supergirl. So whatever the heck this thing is, some sort of robot that can shape shift. I like this issue, but I feel like it was supposed to do something in terms of, like, character development of, like, oh, what, see through Supergirl's deepest nightmares or whatever. And honestly, because she was making such a point so early on of, like, wait a minute, this didn't happen like this, it lost all of that. Like, the whole part with her mom just abandoning her and being like, no, you must live your fate on your own. I felt like that was the way we were going, and then they immediately just pivoted to, like, no, now she's fighting dragons, the whole issue, which I'm not opposed to. I very much liked that, and I thought it was very interesting and looked great. Mahmoud Asrar did a great job there. But it was it was just a little bit of a tonal whiplash of, like, oh, we were going to do this emotional thing with the mom, but then, no, dragons. And then we ended it with Saban maybe being evil for like 10 seconds before kicking back to good because of her brother. Genuinely, I don't know where they're going to go with this. I enjoyed this issue, though. I know I sound like I'm bouncing around in a lot of places, but I did enjoy this issue. So overall, I'm going to give this one a 7.5. I did really enjoy it. Um, I now know how to pronounce Shaban, which that only took three months longer than it should have, but now I don't sound like an idiot. Green Lantern Corps number 10, written by Peter Tomasi, art by Fernando Pissarin. Last issue we left off with Jon Stewart being found guilty for his crime of killing fellow Green Lantern Kurt and being sentenced to death by the Alpha Lanterns. This issue picks up literally saying those exact words that I just said, hereby sentenced to death. And pretty much the entire audience of Green Lanterns is super not okay with that. 
Like, they're like, no, no, that's a bad call. To which all of the, and of course, you know, he, because he put in his plea of guilty or whatever, he didn't contest it, uh, he's not allowed to have a appeal or anything like that. He will be sentenced to death soon in a manner of choosing by the Alpha Lanterns or whatever. And basically they tell the entire audience like, okay, we're going to kill him soon. Not here though. So everyone go home. And then nobody budges and they're like, go home. And then one of them's like, what if we don't? You're going to kill us too? And then they're like, all right, we can see we've touched some nerves here. We're going to keep him instead of the normal holding cells where you guys are going to try something stupid. We're going to keep him in our tower. And then they fly off. So once there, John talks to the guards and it's like, hey, look, you know I'm not going to run. Can you just take these like handcuffs off me? I'll stay in my cage. Just take the handcuffs off. And they're like, yeah, no, we, we trust you. You're good. So they're not totally, you know, just like, no, we're here to punish. Mwahaha. But uh, basically he talks to one and says like, look, on Earth, where I come from, we're entitled to like some last requests. And he's like, all right, what are those requests? And he's like, I just want to apologize to the only people that I should be apologizing to. So then we see the ring that belonged to Kurt, and it's making its way through its sector trying to find somebody else. And it scans this one college, it seems like, and it breaks in through the window, lands on the professor's finger. He starts transforming into a green lantern, and then immediately the ring's like, actually, you know what, never mind. And it zooms off his finger again, to which the college student's like, oh my god, you were almost a green lantern. And the professor's like, yeah, what happened? So then we cut to Jon Stewart again, and he's being met by the father and brother of Kurt, and immediately the, he, he starts trying to apologize, being like, look, I'm so sorry, I should have told you before. He's smacked by the brother, and was just like, what, why, why, why? Just tell me why. And the father's, like, completely inconsolable, super angry at um, John. But John just starts making the plea. He's like, look, I don't want your forgiveness. I know that you can, may never forgive me. I just hope that you can understand that soldiers, that's what we are. We are always being pushed closer and closer to our limit. And sometimes we're pushed to the point where we can't bear it anymore. Kurt met his limit that day. I hit mine a long time ago. And there's nothing, there's no shame in that. It happens to all of us. But you, like, you just hope that when it happens, you're able to get out. And Kurt wasn't able to them so the father walks away he's never going to forgive but the brother steps up and he's like i know my brother wouldn't want people to die because of him and i do forgive you but i just miss my brother and he walks off sadly so then we get the guardians meeting up with the alpha lanterns and guys also there and the alpha lanterns are basically like do you not like our verdict either and they're like no we don't like your verdict we think it was a stupid verdict and you shouldn't have been doing that and the Alphalands like, you're you going to overrule our verdict and completely throw our entire system in the trash? I'm like, no. No, we believe in the system. You, we just want you to know that we don't like your verdict, but you are going to go ahead and go through with whatever it is. But you should be keeping in mind emotional impact. And they're like, I thought that you make all your decisions without emotions. And like, we do, but we still know that other people feel them, and you're going to cause a lot of chaos with this. But we know you made it based off rule of law or whatever. Guy, why are you just standing over there? And guys like, oh, I'm sorry, do you want me to get angry? I'm not. I'm going to keep my cool here. You guys know this is a load of crap, so what am I even bothering? Um, so anyway, the Alpha Lanterns and stuff, and they're like, all right, whatever. So we came here for uh, how we're going to kill them. Uh, we think that the Guardians should be able to, like, just painlessly do it the way they have before. And it's like, no, the Guardians aren't going to do that. I'm like, okay, well, then we can make a firing squad of Lanterns chosen by lottery, to which immediately guys like, no, that's not going to happen. And then they said, like, well, we could hire somebody from off-planet to kill him. And immediately they shoot that one down. They're like, no, 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 here's the deal. If you want Jon Stewart to die, you're going to do it yourself. The Alpha Lanterns are going to be at the one to kill Guy, or to kill Jon Stewart. And Guy rushes off in a huff because he's the one who told him that. To which the Guardian's are like, yeah, we hate having to agree with Guy Gardner, but yeah, you're going to have to do it. So... Anyway, we see the guy is bringing uh, John Stewart his last meal request, and he's got in like one of those fine dining dishes. And one of the Alpha Lanterns is like, "You better not try anything, guy. I swear, I swear, man, you better not try anything." I was like, "You scanned me. I'm not going to try anything. I'm bringing him my friend my his final lunch." 
and he brings him up to him. He makes a table out of Green Lantern construct. And Jon Stewart is immediately just, like, waxing philosophically of, like, oh, we all have our own time, and I'm just doing what I feel is right. And Guy's like, dude, shut up. You know we're going to figure out a way out of this. this is, we, just, we need to bide our time for whatever. And it's like, basically, John asked for, let me see if I have here, samosas, garlic naan, and chicken tikka masala. But Guy Gardner brought him milk, cereal, and toast. To which he's like, yeah, sorry, didn't really have time to make your uh, actual requested meal. What with the escape plan and all. To which then there's a full page spread of the entire Alpha Lantern Tower being hit with this giant construct axe. And just the roof being chopped off it. Guy grabs John, immediately starts taking off. And then we see all the lanterns who have been on missions with them so far. And including... uh, just, you know, everyone that we've seen in over that last arc, they're all fighting against the Alpha Lanterns, trying to provide some cover and some distance for uh, Guy and John to get away. Guy's ring is, or sorry, John's ring is, of course, completely tapped out, so they have to make their way to the central power battery. And John's like, no, I'm not going to, I've accepted my fate. To which Guy Gardner knocks John out, puts his ring in the battery against his will, grabs him again, and they both take off somewhere. Uh, but then we meet back up with the Alpha Lanterns and the rest of the Corps that's fighting them. And basically the Alpha Lanterns call on some super special power they have to shut down all of the attacking member of the Corps' rings. And that's where we leave off. Okay, so I like the bit where John is saying, hey, I'm sorry to Kurt's family. I definitely like the part where Guy is just saying, like, no... And the, he's a guy and the Guardians are agreeing on how this has been so mishandled. Which, if both those sides of a completely opposite se- spectrum agree that you did it poorly, then you did it poorly. It's a good job of uh, showing that off. Um, RY is fantastic. I really do like the full page spread here of the top of the Alpha Quarter Tower just being completely destroyed. It's got a good sense to it of scale. The battle scene afterwards gets a little bit messy, but otherwise, pretty good overall. Uh, no, it's it's just a good issue. Just a nice, solid issue. It's not blowing me back with anything. Like, I think two issues ago was kind of the prime example of, like, that was really, really good. Um, but no, this is a solid arc that's just worked through the emotions of John and how he's doing that. I do kind of like the fact that, like, we're not doing that thing where it's like, oh, this one piece of evidence that changes everything. It's like, no, we're just genuinely becoming outlaws now like that's all it is we're just going against what the decided and proper verdict was so nah it's it's an interesting concept and i'd like to see how they play it out from here i'm personally gonna give this one 7.5 very well done um just not quite as super amazing as prior issues have been i would even say the prior issue but definitely the one before that so it's good that's all i really have to say on this is it's just good Captain Adam, number 10, written by J.T. Kroll, art by Freddie Williams II. Last issue we left off with all the different Captain Adams in time, discovering that Kronomota, a.k.a. the big bad energy, is actually himself in the far-off distant future, where he's just a big bad energy monster. Uh, This issue picks up in the time stream. It's actually, like, very easy to explain what's going on, but also extremely difficult at the same time. Easy to give broad strokes, hard to give details. So, basically, all the Captain Atoms start realizing, like, oh, there's the energy thing. Let's all get our bearings and start fighting as best we can. But then we see as they go towards the energy thing, it does take a solid form and becomes this giant, like, the best I can describe is the worm from Tremors. That. So, they all start firing on it. It's absorbing all the energy as fast as they can shoot it out. And they're like, okay, um, what do we do? And the one Captain Atom that's like a little bit more diminutive from the beginning of this arc was like, okay, you guys keep it busy for as long as you can. I have an idea. And he just goes to before all of this happened. And we see his thought process is like, here's the thing. I need to go back and change something so that this doesn't happen. I could go back and stop myself from being in the accident at all. If like, I could just stop there. Like I could make the experiment successful. But what would happen if 
Dr. Magala is able to reach another dimension. Like, what kind of horrors would be unleashed on the world? I could also go back and, if I want to be selfish, I could stop. I could save my father. That would stop me from ever, like, joining that military in the first place. But that seems like it would cause a whole lot of problems because who instead would be in that room except for me? Like, would they have the same wherewithal? He realizes that the whole reason that Corona Mona came to be a thing was because Captain Adam at some point started developing somewhat of a God complex, believing that he truly could become the savior of humanity. So he had to go back and stop that. And he just we see him piercing back through the times. Where did it happen? And he realizes that the moment it happened was the moment that he saved Mikey, that little kid, from cancer. So the only way to stop the destruction of all time and space is he has to go back and stop himself from curing that boy's cancer and letting him die. So we see him go back to that moment. Uh, back in the time stream, all the Captain Adams are fighting up against the big bad purple energy. And it starts speaking to them and only our Captain Adam is not listening to it. But the other Captain Adams start being basically absorbed into its thought process of seeing the way it sees everything and how it is truly their destiny to become this. So it's pointless to resist. So we see uh, that Captain Adam is being attacked by all the other Captain Adams. And in order to stop them, he's like, well, wait a minute, you're me. I can just absorb you and there won't be any consequences. So he absorbs the other Captain Adams and then he becomes this huge hulked out version of Captain Adam that is able to go a bit more toe-to-toe with the Chronomota version of him. So then we cut back and we see how uh, the other Captain Adam is stopping the cancer from truly being cured even after all the stuff that he put through. And so the time stream does some weird stuff. It all it ripples around them as he changes things. And then we see it's back to essentially the present. And... Captain Adam is flying over top of a graveyard and sees that the parents of Mikey are standing there over their child's grave. And he's like, wait a minute. No, I saved him. Did did I not get all the cancer? I'm sure I did. What? I must not have done it. I must not be as powerful as I thought I was. So then he goes back to the continuum. He talks to Dr. Magala. This was apparently just after they cured, um, what's her name, Uh, Renita's hand. So she's going out on that date with um, Scott, I think his name was. And Magala is basically just like, man, I don't understand why people want dinner. We're we're looking for all the answers of the universe here, and people are going out for dinner. And Captain Adam's like, yeah, about that. I'm going to be taking five. I'll be back in a bit. So he goes out to the restaurant where he knows Renita is at. And he, he looks at her, and it turns out that Scott's not there yet. He's stuck in traffic, and she's just sitting there alone at the table. And... Captain Adam realizes, like, you know what? Maybe I'm not, I can't be God, but maybe, just maybe, I can be human. So he separates out his essence, the thing, like, he takes a human form, but there are two different Captain Adams now. There's Captain Adam, the atomic being, and there's Captain Adam, Nathaniel. There's just a guy. He's just a guy. And he... They have a mental link. They're able to, like, communicate. Maybe there's a hive mind or something like that. But Nathaniel makes his way inside the restaurant, sits down with Renita, and they just share a drink. Meanwhile, actual Captain Adam is standing outside watching in the rain, and he's like, maybe they, they seem to be enjoying themselves. Good for them. So he still sees himself on the outside and that he's just watching what his life could have been with Renita just unfolding. Like, literally, it's happening. So... That's it. That's where the issue ends. It's a strange... Like, as soon as you get into the different versions of you and altering the time stream and da-da-da-da-da, it always gets confusing. But I think that it dealt with it pretty well. I think it dealt with it in terms of, like, this is the natural... If you had a guy with a god complex and he also had the powers of God, where would he end up? And I think that did a pretty good analyzation of that. And then it showed how can you undo it and what ramifications would that do? I don't I, I like how this is a thing of, you know, it changes something, but then it changes everything. It's just a little butterfly effect going on throughout this world, essentially. So, no, I'm very much enjoying how this is done. And I'm I feel like this is the end of the arc. It just has a sense of finality to it. But, you know, I, 
We'll see you in the next issue how it continues on. This particular one, I'm going to go ahead and give a... I'm giving a 7.5, and the only reason I bring it down from an 8, because it would be an 8, is just because the part where he's, he's in the time stream fighting Chronomoda, as soon as you recognize that the other Captain Adam has to change the past, that entire fight scene feels like it has no weight to it. It's like, no, it's just going to, as soon as the past has changed, then it's just not going to matter because it's all going to ripple out. So that's my only thing with that is it makes up a decent size of the issue. But it is done well enough and it looks fantastic that it still gets points just for that. So 7.5 for this. Definitely enjoy. DC Universe presents number 10. James Robinson writing Bernard Chang on art. This is part two of the Vandal Savage story. And last issue we left off with basically Vandal Savage agreeing to help his daughter. He's going to be the Hannibal Lecter to this serial killer case. But he also gets to go out in the field because why not? Um, This issue picks up with a flashback. It's the last day of school or something like that. And we got this little girl just happily putting a stick against the fence and just walking home having a grand old time on her own and then she gets into the house and sees her mother looking super sad at the tv and it turns out that her father vandal savage this is cassidy um has murdered a lot of people uh he is apparently known as the cherry blossom killer and he beat the fbi raided his law firm and he killed all of them along with some employees and They set up all these road traps and stuff like that so that he couldn't escape. And rather than just eluding them, he just killed his way through those as well. He's not a good dude. Regardless, the FBI shows up at their house. And the mother is completely distraught, but is just like, yeah, no, I'm totally... You guys take whatever you need. Screw my husband. How how dare he put us in this situation? So, anyway, we flash forward to today and Cassidy's like, do you ever think about my mom he's like oh you mean my wife yes of course i do no that's a lie actually i don't not really i mean what can i say i'm a terrible man and Cass is like yeah yeah that's pretty much what i expected so uh you've clearly got some plan going on right and before he can answer like oh eta we're at our destination and then it's just like well get a Guess you'll have to see what I got cooking, but just remember, even if I am a monster, I'm still your father. So then we get a cut of the villain, the guy who they're after. Uh, it's this super tall dude with like talon-like hands, white hair, and he's like, "Oh, don't be upset. You you have a role of honor tonight, and this is, you you should be happy. It will all be over soon." As this girl is just crying and crying. Uh, so then Vandal Savage and his daughter get off the helicopter. And they walk over to the crime scene. And Vandal basically just tells him, like, well, I can tell that she was attacked from above. And uh, it was probably something. The boy was horribly disfigured. The girl was probably taken as a sacrifice. To which his daughter's like, that was literally everything that was in our file. We got that from another witness. Stop yanking our chain here. Tell us something we don't know. And Vandal looks up at the stars and makes a comment about it before pointing out, like, no. See, here's the thing. For my stuff... I always had a very systematic method of following the stars in order to figure out where the sacrifice had to take place on any given night. If my guy knows, if the guy here knows anything about my stuff, of how I did things, he's going to follow those same star paths. And he points in a direction where he points out that there's some like messing with the foliage that they didn't notice. And he's like, he probably took her straight through there, which is the same direction I would go in this unit. So he, he, she asks for directions of like, okay, well, point it out on a map. And he's like, no, we use the stars. Give me a sextant. And he's like, oh, and I, we have Google Maps, Dad. I'm just going to go ahead and use that. And she's like, no, you don't understand. When I was doing my thing, there were stars in the sky that are no longer here anymore. Like, I am that old. Get me a sextant, goddammit. So they get him a sextant. He follows the stars, and he leads them out to this abandoned church out in the middle of the forest. And he, he, they basically say, like, yeah, no, this is... It seems like it's a killery sort of place. Dad, are you sure about that? And it's like, this is exactly where I would have chosen. So then Cass turns around and says, like, all right, you two agents, take him back in the holding. He's not going to be around to see this. And he's like, come on. 
let me stay. And he's like, no, clearly you have some sort of plan going on. You're not going to be here for it. So they escort him back to the chopper as uh, his daughter is ready to start moving in on the church. And as they're making their way back towards the chopper, he's like, wait a minute, hold on. Something's not right. If, if I was doing this, then I would sometimes occasionally make additional sacrifices because of this, that, who the, whatever it is. He's just basically saying they're walking into a trap. And he's begging the agents like, hey, just call her. You have radio contact. Just call over and tell her that I think this. I'm not going against your orders here. Just pass that along. And they're like, yeah, not going to happen. So then he immediately like beats up one of them and like smashes their head. And then, you know, a whole fight scene breaks out. Meanwhile, we see the other agents over the course of his whole narration of figuring this out. Um, His daughter also comes to the exact same conclusion. This is like, Wait a minute, something's not right here. Everybody pull out. But before they can, this man, talons for hand, just goes around and starts basically lopping off heads. And this fight scene coincides with Vandal's fight scene at the same time, where it's just full-on, like, head chopping off and bodies being brought into the underbrush. Um, She turns around and is ready to fire a shot, but then he gets the upper hand on her. Of course not killing her. Uh, But then we see Vandal this entire time he's been fighting. He's actually been... Like, the chopper's taken off. It's up in the sky. So he opens up the uh, drop chute, and he just jumps out of it, and he manages to get his cuffs off thanks to a key around the neck of one of the agents that he took. And he, as he as he does so, he he's like, ha-ha, I'm free, finally free. And he we then see that the villain has Vandal Savage's daughter in captivity, and he's like, that's fantastic. I'm so happy to have this. And that's where the issue leaves off. It sounded really disjointed, but it it honestly flowed pretty well there. My only issue that I had was the opening stuff where it's just like, yeah, no, they're just talking about whether or not Vandal Savage has a plan. And, like, clearly, clearly there's some sort of underhanded thing he's trying to do here. But, like, they keep on playing and it's like, ooh, what's it going to be? And fine, if you want to have that as a mystery, have that as a mystery. I have no problem with that at all. But it's like, we get it. He's conniving. You don't have to sit there and just, like, poke it over and over like, ooh, Aren't you aren't you wondering how he's going to do how he's going to do the thing? Like yeah, clearly I am. Thank you for bringing that up every 3 pages. Besides that though, um I like the design of the villain. I think it's it's well enough done. It's a good contrast to Vandal who has long dark hair and is very built. He this guy's very slender, long white hair. It's a good contrast. Um I like his escape scene from the helicopter. It's just got a good sense of motion to it and like how high he really is coming off the thing. Also, I think this is the first instance where we do have direct, like, yes, he is definitely immortal because he just survived this fall. So, no, nah, it's it's a solid issue. I have a few tiny little gripes with it, but for the most part, it's a solid read. I did like the intro part of here's the reveal of her finding out. Oh, and by the way, uh, when the FBI did finally confront them at their homes, he, he killed all of them too. And may as well has killed his wife, but didn't actually, so... Yeah, no, it's it's solid. I'm going to go ahead and give it a 7.5. I'm enjoying it so far. Um, this definitely felt like the part where, you know, okay, we're diverging from the Silence of the Lambs and we're going into our own story. And I'm curious to see how that turns out. I don't know how many issues the Vandal Savage story actually is. I think it's like four, maybe five. So we'll see how quickly they wrap it up. But it is interesting so far. Wonder Woman number 10, written by Brian Azzarello, art by Tony Atkins and Kano. Uh, Last issue we left off with Hades telling Wonder Woman, hey, I'm going to put the lasso truth on you, and then you have to confess your love. And if you don't actually love me, I'm going to hurt you real bad. So picking up in this issue, just the exact same thing. She has the lasso, which is, of course, in a noose configuration, put around her neck and... Basically, Wonder Woman's like, you don't trust me? And he's like, oh, you say that like it's so terrible. It's just proof of that. I won't need to trust you if you pass this test. So he asks her, do you love me, Wonder Woman? To which Wonder Woman stands there for a second and says, hell, I do love you. 
And she's like, awesome, great, the wedding can continue. But then Wonder Woman's like, excuse me? No. And she pulls off the um, lasso that was tied around the like pole nearby her and gets it free and then leaps off the stage onto a horse that's waiting nearby and starts just going away from Hades being like, you don't trust me. You, 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 I'm never going to be in any sort of relationship that has no amount of trust in it. I won't be bound that way to any man, woman, or God. And she starts getting away on the horse. This issue at this point just moves so quickly. Um, basically, she's just escaping. But of course, the entire everything is made up of all the souls in hell. So literally the ground is just reaching out to grab her. And there's, he's just making a giant wall out of souls. And she, of course, uses her horse, gets over top of it. A couple of Hades... I don't know what you want to call them, concubines, ex-wives, whatever they are. They're like, no, you'll never escape. See, you've made this so much worse for yourself. Your life is over. And she just kicks them off. And she leaps over all the souls. It's no big deal. The entire time she's talking to Hades, because Hades is speaking through the souls. And he's like, I will find you and your, your girl Zola. And she's like, yeah, maybe. But I'm going to make your life so much worse trying to do so. So just basically putting up a tough act. We see that those... XYZ concubines are dropped off right in front of Hephaestus and all the other ones. And um, they attack them, but of course are very quickly beaten back. To which Wonder Woman then arrives and just be like, What are you guys doing here? You're supposed to be with Zola. To which Hephaestus is like, the Hermes is with her. And he's like, oh, right. Sorry, I thought all of you were down here. Okay, whatever. We should, uh, y you should go. This is my fight. You guys shouldn't be involved. To which then Hades then arrives in a giant wave of blood. And he's like, oh, okay. Hi, everyone. I knew you would be here causing some chaos. Uh, this is now turning from a wedding into an execution. To which Hades then brings up a giant, like, best way I can describe it is Attack on Titan. Just a Titan-looking thing. And he, he grabs Wonder Woman and she's like, you would condemn me for telling the truth? And he's like, yeah, I would. Because you, you will never leave. I'm going to keep on consuming you for all eternity. And he throws Wonder Woman into his mouth and she's about to be swallowed. To which Strife, in her like big form, just punches through the back of Hades' head, grabs Wonder Woman and pulls her out. And Wonder Woman's like, can't you guys just let me do this on my own? To which Strife is like, do you understand what goes into being consumed? Like, yeah, you'll be fine on the way out, but like, it's the middle bits you're not going to like. And she's like, just let me do this on my own. And she's like, no, that's not going to happen. So Hades in his like actual god form steps up. He's got the pistols of Eros and he's like, all right, let her fight. She can't win. To which she, one on one basically steps up and be like, I'm willing to fight you forever because I can't lose. Like I may never win, but I can never lose either. I'm always going to be here fighting you. And Hades is like, why did you say that you love me? Why did you lie? And she's like, I didn't lie. I love you. And I love everyone. That's my whole thing. I'm infinite compassion. To which he, he genuinely can't understand it. And Hephaestus steps up and he's like, yeah, here's the thing, Hades. Like, I am so disappointed in all of the gods because we are capable of so much, yet we have our, so many of our little petty infights. And it's because we're just, like, not even capable of feeling love for each other. And Hades, he takes that and he's just like... <sighs> So what? What am I supposed to do? And basically, one of them tells him, like, no, the reason that Eros' gun didn't work on me, it didn't make me fall in love with you, is because you feel no love for yourself. You have to love yourself first. For instance, Eros, he loves nothing more than himself. And Eros is like, what the? I wasn't even a part of this. Why are you making this about me? So one of them tries to come up and console Hades. He's just like, no, just, just go. Take your stupid guns and just go. So... Hephaestus passes over the wedding gift that he brought along and they all just leave and as they're making their way out on the boat Wonder Woman's like hey uh, Eros can I can I see your guns one last time and he's like sure and she just lines up and takes a shot across like this the river sticks and we see Hades unpacking his wedding gift and it's just what seems to be just a mirror just staring back at himself but then Wonder Woman shoots Hades with Eros's gun which seemingly causes all this wax that's built up on his head from like this candle thing he's got going on to just fall off and he's just a normal guy underneath or something i don't know it's a bit esoteric but that's where the issue ends honestly a little bit underwhelming like 
I really like this whole thing they had going on in the first part with Hera and like they brought in Poseidon and Hades to play like this big mental match and all that. And then the whole like they got double crossed by Hades and then this whole arc started. And now it's just like yeah, I just I just talked for a while and that's that's enough. Hades understood that what he did is wrong. Like it wasn't even they beat him really. Like Strife kind of did, but Wonder Woman didn't even, she was just like, I'm willing to fight forever. And I guess you could see that the same sort of thing as like a Doctor Strange versus Mephisto or whatever, or Dormammu, whatever his name was. But like, it didn't have that same punch to it because they didn't, it lasted literally all of like three minutes. Like, she got up to the thing, she ran away, Hades took on a single second form, and then they just talked it out. And I'm like, that doesn't feel like, him being worn down. That just feels like he's he was already like not invested in this at all. And he was talking a big game. So I don't know. It just felt a little bit underwhelming for me. Um, Art-wise, it's okay. Some pages hit better than others. I think the page of like the giant fleshy form of Hades and like the pool of blood, that works out really well. But then this page where they're like on the boat just driving away doesn't for some reason i think it's something in the faces but i honestly couldn't tell you directly so overall i'm gonna give this one a i i think just the 6.5 i it's very close to a seven but it's just it feels wrong to say it's a seven so 6.5 for this um i hope that right now we're done with the haiti stuff if this was the path we were going to take let's i like the hephaestus stuff we can get back to that i'm good with the, even the uh zola stuff let's pretty much anything except for this particular arc of let's get married because that just seemed completely out of nowhere for me so yeah a little disappointed blue beetle number 10 written by tony bedard art by ig guara last issue we left off with Blue Beetle meeting up with Green Lantern Kyle Rayner and trying to get some advice from him. And it, he had to go off-world, so now he's stuck with nobody again. Uh, this issue opens up in media res. Uh, Blue Beetle is basically chained up in some high-tech gizmo, being shocked in intense pain. And there's some scientists there just like, well, he's definitely an alien, but I, I, I just can't get through that suit. And they're like, oh, well, let's try drilling next time. So then Blue Beetle screams out like, why are you doing this to me? And in steps Director Bones of the DEO. And he's like, oh, it's because you're an alien and this is the DEO. And it's kind of our thing. We're going to get some answers even if it's from your autopsy. And he's like, I came to you. Why would I be trying to hurt you when I came to you? And he's like, don't try your mumbo jumbo on me. You're a bad seed. So seven hours earlier, we see what he did after Green Lantern left. And basically he needed some food. But he didn't have money, so the suit is able to extract nutrients from garbage, to which Jaime's not really a fan of. He's like, oh, can we li like literally do like anything else besides this? Um, and he sits and he thinks for a while, and he's like, okay. During that issue with Green Lantern, he dropped off like that bounty hunter from outer space with someone else. So clearly there's somebody here who he trusts. Can we get in contact with them? And he's like the Department of Extra Normal Affairs, or uh, what is it called, Department of Operations. He's like, yes, no, no, we can get in contact with them. They've already been tracking us. And Jaime's like, wait, really? Why don't you tell me these things, man? Why, do, why are you going to tell me this stuff? So then we see the DEO HQ shortly afterwards. Uh, Director Bones is just, you know, dealing with some issues on, like, Hawkman, Static, and Firestorm. And then his office gets a call, and apparently up in the lobby there's a visitor. And it's Blue Beetle who just passed through the metal detector and is just, like, asking to speak to the boss. Meanwhile, he's held a gunpoint at, like, a thousand directions. He's like, D would it help if I said Green Lantern sent me? So then we get a real quick cut back to Texas with his family. And his mother is trying, just yelling at his dad, being like, I don't care if you don't want to do it. You have to call her. It's, it, he hasn't called us in days. Like, you have to make contact here. And he's like, I don't want to, but I guess I will. And he hops off the phone, and apparently he's calling up his mother, Jaime's grandmother. And she lives in New York. And he's like, hey, Mom, um, 
So Jaime ran away, and she immediately just starts going off on him. and like, oh, you're a terrible parent, blah, blah, blah. And he tells her, like, no, he's in New York. That's where we know he was last, at least. Been there for a few days. And she's just like, what? He's been here and he hasn't said hi? Uh, you stay out of this. This is now a case for Abluita Canchi. So Jaime's grandma is on the case, I guess. So anyway, back at the DEO, uh, Blue Beetle's being led at gunpoint down to some elevators. And... Basically, he's just telling him, like, look, just don't shoot, please. Not because, not because like, it would hurt me, but because it would ricochet off me and maybe hurt one of you guys, and I don't want that to happen. They're like, noted, thank you. And then they, the elevator starts going down, and he's like, wouldn't the boss be up on the upper floors? And they're like, yeah, you, that's all just a facade. Like, the real stuff goes on downstairs. So they step off into this, basically, a detention center block for aliens. And... He sees, like, a normal gray-looking alien. And then there's the bounty hunter from before. And the bounty hunter's like, Hey, where do you think you are, man? What, you, you finally decide to go bad? And he's like, don't don't act like you're talking to me. I'm not, I'm not, I'm a hero. You're a bad guy. He's like, yeah, you're a hero. You're a scarab with the reach. And immediately alarms start going off. And apparently it triggered a thing of, like, the reach is a bunch of planet-demolishing people. As you would see in, I believe, issue 10... No, issue 9 of Green Lantern New Guardians. But, um, yeah, no, he, he, they immediately turn on him. It's Code Red, DEFCON 5, and they uh, start putting in a whole bunch of noxious gas trying to knock out Blue Beetle, to which nothing works. But then they start pulling out some extraterrestrial weapons, which do something. But the something is enough to basically shut down the Blue Beetle and knock out Jaime. So, sometime later, a.k.a. present day, he wakes up. And Director Bones is like, yeah, we got that from some Kuhned scout ship. It uh, is a boson pulse which, quote, messes with your Nevu Schwartz five brains, whatever those are. So regardless, at this point, it's just basically Director Bones talking to Jaime saying, like, here's the thing. We have footage of you basically just bumming around New York. And, like, yes, you set fire to that runaway boys home but like you haven't been doing anything that bad yet you have enough tech in you to level the city so i'm just trying to figure you out man like what is going on with you what is your real objective if you are an alien who came here just to bum around new york well then i'm going to let my scientists do whatever they can to basically get all your secrets and all your tech from you if there is a human underneath that suit however then by all means i'd invite you to come work with us because that's like, you could be a great asset, and I would love to know more about it. And the suit's basically telling him, like, keep your identity secret. You remember what Kyle Rayner said? And Jaime's like, Kyle Ra oh, I'm sorry, we're trusting Green Lantern now? And he's like, yeah, we are. Keep your identity a secret. So Blue Beetle basically just tells him, like, look, you you got to trust me on this, especially if you're working with the government. I just, you got to let me go. And he's like, yeah, why? He's like, because you're not going to like what happens when you back me into a corner. And then Jaime starts using his suit and basically... Blows a fuse for the entire DEO compound. He just takes down the power for a few uh, minutes. To which Jaime jumps on top of Director Bones with a power charge, like Mega Man, like charged up right his face, and he's just like, don't do anything stupid. And he's like, yeah, what are you going to do? You're going to blow my hand up, head off? You think that's going to be the end of it? He's like, no, I'm not. I just wanted you to know that I came here for help. That's the only reason I came here is because I don't know how to control this stuff. And he's like, well, why didn't you say so? Come with me. We'll work this out. And he's like, no, screw you. We're done. I'm out. And he flies out of the building. And then all the scientists are like, should we should we go act after him? And Director Bones is like, nah, I'll, I'll figure out how to deal with him later. We'll, we will get back to Blue Beetle and the DEO. So then cut to Brooklyn, the offices of Superfail, a.k.a. that website that keeps on badmouthing Blue Beetle. And... They're like, hey, why is Blue Beetle doing so hot? And some people are like, because he totally pimp slapped that one girl. And he's like, no, it's because he looks like a bug. And people are able to get, like, if everyone, all these superheroes that we're trying to take down look like bugs, they'd be a lot easier to take down. Otherwise, you know, the ones that look like Superman are too relatable. So, and again, they're just a gossip column. They're not like nefarious or anything like that but as they're saying how they want to take down these metahumans uh who steps in but booster gold saying oh yeah how about me then and he's like ready to fight so booster gold and blue beetle together blue and gold this is basically just a one shot 
I, I mean, it, all of the stuff that was introduced is just as equally wrapped up in this issue. The only thing that is kind of closing the book on is Jaime doesn't seem to really care if he has a mentor anymore. Like, he's just like, yeah, no, I'm done with that. I'll, I'll just strike out on my own. Screw it. Um, I like the Booster Gold setup. I like the Abuelita, Abuelita setup. Both those are very, uh, very interesting. Or maybe it's just Abuela. No, it's Abuelita. Um, no, I, I'm liking them both. So... The only, th and I, I'm genuinely, I like the DEO as well. They, they, Director Bones is a cool looking guy and he's got an interesting enough mechanic with him. So I'm down with all this. I think that it just felt a little bit haphazard and just kind of jumpy overall. Um, but no, it's, it's a fine issue. It does what it needs to do. Overall, I would give this one a, I give it a 7.5. I think it's, I think it's good. I think it's bordering on really good, but it's just not quite there yet. So, yeah, there's not really much more to me to say. I'm looking forward to seeing how this evolves over the next and last batch of issues here. Legion of Superheroes number 10, written by Paul Levitz, art by Francis Portella and Andre Guinaldo. Last issue left off with Brainiac 5 and Dream Girl being kidnapped by the Dominators and... I think it was Star Boy or something like that, quitting the Legion because the Legion was officially told, hey, don't interfere. Uh, this issue picks up with a cosmic boy approaching the Dominators or the Dominion, as it's technically called, embassy, and basically trying to break into it to figure out where the hell his friends are. And he uses his magnetism powers in order to knock out the power briefly, slip his way inside, and he uses some sort of machine or something like that to scan for data and while he's doing so all the power comes back on and he's like crap they're gonna know i'm exiting because i like i broke in I, I gotta figure out how to get out here before they reboot the alarms and before he's able to do anything uh ultra boy i believe it is ultra lad ultra guy uh joe nah is his human name i remember that one because it was dumb uh he swoops in he grabs him and basically escapes People in the embassy saw them. They know that they broke in, but they're like, at least they're out now and they're away from there. So then we cut back to the Dominion where Brainy and Dream Girl are both basically coming to. They're in a room with beds. Like, they are prisoners, but they aren't, you know, being tortured or anything like that. Although Brainiac does have a burn, like a laser cut on his arm, and he, he's not sure what that's for except for tissue harvesting or something like that but basically brainiac's just starting to look over the room seeing if there's anything he can use to get out of here and dream girl just said like all right well i'm gonna go to bed and try to dream have a prophetic dream of how to get out of here and brainiac's like yeah okay thank you you're so much of a help so then we see i don't know some sort of space court talking to monel and they're like okay here's the deal there's no proof that the Dominators did this. We understand you want your friends back. However, you are causing, like, multiple intergalactic crises here by, like, continuously getting up in their face. So, laying down the law now, the Legion is not to do anything regarding any of this, period. Got it? And mon like, fine, I guess. No covert or overt operations. So, you know, they're all annoyed by that. Annoyed they have to sit there and not do anything. Um... But then we see Starboy or whatever uh, and his team of Triplicate Girl, Mwindaji, Otaki, who are both new trainees that like didn't even get into the training process yet, and Bouncing Boy, who I think is retired. And they all are a team of people who are not part of the Legion but are totally going to go out there and find what they need. And basically the mon and Ultra Boy or Cosmic Light are all like, you, you really shouldn't... like." I'm going to push back in the lightest way possible here, to which the team immediately pushes, like, hard. And they're like, no, we're going to do this. We're going to go save our friends. And there's nothing you can do to stop us. So, yeah. Cut back to Brainiac and uh, Dream Girl. They're getting delivered food, to which Brainiac knows they're right on schedule because he's able to keep track of time via his own biorhythms. And then Dream Girl is just kind of grossed out by the food. And they make a little passing jab at how apparently they the Dominators ranked the Legionnaires from dangerous to not dangerous. And Dream Girl is apparently not a threat. So, 
yeah. Uh, then we see basically the Legion is keeping track of that team as they're going out in the deep space. And they're like, look, we can't directly do anything, but if they need help, we can step in and save them. That's a loophole. So then we see that whatever Brainiac was doing, he actually did have a plan to escape. And he made his way out into like the main room along with Dream Girl. We don't actually see this happening. They're just already out in the main room. And they're both fighting their way through a big horde. Dream Girl gets overrun and Brainiac does as well. And they're both immediately brought back into their room. And we're like, all right, well, maybe next time we'll be able to do something differently. But then Dream Girl faints for a second and she realizes like, oh, I had a prophetic dream. We will be saved. And Brainiac's like, nice. However, one on the team will betray us. And then we see, I mean, I don't feel like I have to, there's just a page of the Dominator saying, ah, yes, we're making good progress. It takes a whole page to say that, but yeah, they say that. Anyway, uh, then we see the team flying through space, going to Dominion space in order to get back their teammates. And we see that Bouncing Boy is getting everything prepped as they enter into enemy territory. And then I guess they brought along Comet Queen, who I first, like, they just say is, like, stalking Bouncing Boy. Like, she's the number one leader of his fan club, and he is so not for it. I don't understand this part. This is beyond me. But regardless, he's... Yeah. So anyway, there's that. So anyway, they... Starboy's like, oh, well, now that everybody's here and everybody's ready, we can get to work. With... And he's like... They just explain the new guy's powers as well and whatever. It's just a thing. that they, They're ready to go. Okay. Here's the thing. It sounded disjointed, and that's because, like, I'm still having to remember 12 names here. And it's getting more and more difficult because... They're all boys and lads and lasses and gals. and It's just not easy for me. That being said, there's still... I thought we were past the point. Like, that first arc, they presupposed that I knew all these relationships and all these characters already. And that's annoying. That's really bad in terms of we're coming onto a reboot. You should be reintroducing these things constantly. And they just assumed that I knew. And that was a problem, but then... There was a period, a very brief period, like three issues ago, where I thought, maybe we're past that. Maybe they have, you know, they've introduced all the relations that I'm going to need, and they will just stay good from here on. But then they then they throw, like, this Comic Queen stuff, and they throw in, like, Bouncing Boy was a retired member, along with Triplicate Lass, who apparently already died at some point. And it's just... They were just immediately throwing me back into, yeah, but you don't know nothing about the Legion, which we're 10 issues in, dude. Shouldn't you be telling me this stuff? Like, this should have been the first, the entire first arc should have just been like, here's this, 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 and this. And yes, we had that mini series of Legion Secret Origin, and theoretically that should have done exactly that. But it didn't, because I still, that did not introduce me to, why is Bouncing Boy retired? Why did Triplicate, Triplicate, triplet kit shouldn't be that hard to say lass die already like all this stuff has still happened in their continuity and i am just completely blissfully unaware of it i say blissfully as if i'm not super frustrated right now so i don't know it's just i feel like i'm never going to get to the point in this book where i have a grasp of what's going on because they're just going to keep on reaching deeper and deeper into the continuity that i never had access to and that's just frustrating on my end so for this particular issue I was able to follow it coherently through, even if I didn't understand the relationships between the characters. So I will at least give it a 5.5. You know what? No, 5. I got angry just talking about this book. It's just a flat 5. And that is strictly because art, fine. Not great, fine. A couple pages in here, useless. But I was at least able to follow the story, and I can sense that there are stakes here. It is a hostage rescue mission. I'm able to at least pick up what's going on, and that's worth at least just a bare minimum of five points because it's not the worst. And that's it. That's all the comics that came out from DC Comics this June 20th, 2012. And frankly, it was a very mediocre week. Not a lot of good comics, not a lot of bad ones, just blah the whole way through. And 
It's kind of disappointing, but at least it was only 12 comics, keeping it light when they're keeping it mediocre, unlike next week, which is going to have 14 comics, and I will just tell you what they all are now. We have the number two issue of Batman Incorporated leading us off, in addition to the number 10 issues of Batman the Dark Knight, Superman, Green Lantern New Guardians, Aquaman, Justice League, The Flash, The Fury of Firestorm, The Savage Hawkman, All-Star Western, Voodoo, Teen Titans, I, Vampire, and Justice League Dark. So yeah, back to a normal-sized week that week. Hopefully it will be better than this week. But you know what I know will be better is in about 10 episodes' time, we have episode number 52, a big old anniversary special. I say that because not only do I have to cover a whole bunch of backup comics, but I also have pretty much a full slate of normal comics that week as well. So it is going to be a full week. That being said, I am always open to suggestions about anything else I should be doing to celebrate the new year of this show. So go ahead and just let me know any thoughts you may have on that. How do we let you know? I'm glad you asked, Random Voice. You can hit me up on Twitter at DC Comics Podcast, all one word. Additionally, we have a Patreon while you're just hanging out on the internet, and that is Mild Fuzz TV. Again, all one word. For as low as a dollar, you can waste a dollar. That, however, is it for me. As I said in the beginning, check out the subreddit because that's pretty much where I'm spending my time nowadays. And, uh... Yeah, thank you very much for listening, for watching, for doing however it is you interact with this show. And as always, try to remember that if it ain't broke, don't fix it.